Well, welcome everyone to the last respiratory lecture. The last one, and then uh, next week I will start the urinary system, the kidneys, good stuff. And I'll start, I have not shown you a skull yet. And you can see this one is an exceptional athlete. It's in the United States out west, and it has an amazing respiratory system. So I don't know if you guys know what this is. It's a male, but we'll talk about him at the end of this lecture. All right, so let's, we've talked about the anatomy in an earlier, earlier lecture about everything from, you know, the lungs, microscopically the alveoli, and then up the, the bronchi, the trachea, the larynx, the pharynx, into the, the nasal cavity, and the sinuses, all this, make sure you review all that. Let's get down to the nitty gritty of <clears throat> gas exchange here. So what's just critically important, of course, is this respiratory membrane just super, super thin. What you got here is the, you got the blood vessel and the capillary, by the time it's a capillary, it only has a, you know, a single layer of squamous cells. And then you're gonna have the alveoli, the, the cells are gonna be squamous, super thin, just like that. And then there's gonna be a little basement membrane because all epithelial tissues need that too. But this, this thin membrane is all that separates the blood cells from the air. So you can see it's critical that it's super thin and the diffusion can take place across the shortest distance possible. And if you remember, there's two types of alveolar cells called pneumocytes and they'd be type one, which is your normal squamous cells that are really super thin. And then the type two pneumocytes are chunkier, they're found in the corners, and uh, they secrete that substance that keeps your um, alveoli from collapsing, which is surfactant. All right, this respiratory membrane, I can show you a little closer right here. Um, and again, I guess I don't need to tell you again, but um, here you're gonna have, uh, uh, on top of the, uh, Lining the inside of the alveoli is going to be a thin layer of surfactant, of course. Thin layer of this, um, this lipid-rich material that decreases the surface tension so your alveoli don't shut together and allow them to stay open. Remember, premature infants before 35 weeks don't make this, and so that's the critical um, time when they can live on their own without a ventilator and such. Yeah. And you can see the type 2 here found throughout that are going to be uh, secreting the surfactant. And the type ones are all these, most of the cells that make up the alveoli. All right. So again, with the, uh, these numbers, you just, you have to know that inside the lung, deep in the alveoli, that these are the concentrations of oxygen and carbon dioxide. That's what they are. And you can see carbon dioxide is quite high in there because you've been dumping it out of your, your blood. And oxygen is lower than outside because it's deep in the lung. You can't, you can't, you're not replacing that air. You're just kind of re refreshing it with each breath. So, although that's what they are, um, there's a much higher level of oxygen than the blood that comes back. The blood coming back is only 40 millimeters of, of, of uh, of oxygen. You can see that um, it's 104 in the air. So diffusion is going to happen like crazy. That oxygen is going to go into that blood and it'll continue to move diffusion until they've equil equilibrated, until the blood itself is 104. And then no more movement can take place by diffusion. So the partial pressure of oxygen coming in and the uh, pulmonary arteries, the arterial side, remember, will uh, be 40. And then by the time it leaves on the venous end, it'll be the same as in the air in the alveoli, 104. Carbon dioxide comes in at 45 uh, millimeters mercury partial pressure. In the air in the lungs, it's 40. So carbon dioxide is going to move out of the blood into the alveoli. And with each breath, you know, you'll dispose of that carbon dioxide. And by the time the carbon dioxide leaves on the other end, you can see it's goes from a higher 45 to the 40. 
so it has equilibrated also all right so I go over those numbers one more time for you here just so you understand it happens by diffusion and the other thing of course you guys remember what the partial pressure of the arterial blood is it's not 104 by the time it leaves the lungs it's going to be 95. that's going to be the uh, partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood that's going to come back to the left side of your heart and not the aorta respiration serves as a means for the body to exchange gases with the atmosphere via the blood the partial pressure of oxygen, PO2, in the air in the alveolar spaces in the lungs is greater than the PO2 in the blood, so oxygen diffuses into red blood cells from air in the lungs. Also, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, PCO2, in the air in the lungs is less than the PCO2 in the blood, so carbon dioxide diffuses out from red blood cells and into the air in the lungs. Oxygen-rich blood is carried through pulmonary veins to the heart and then pumped through systemic arteries to the body. The PO2 in the blood is higher than the PO2 in the body tissues, so oxygen diffuses out from red blood cells at the body tissues. Also, the PCO2 in the blood is lower than the PCO2 in the body tissues, so carbon dioxide diffuses into red blood cells there. Oxygen-poor blood is carried through systemic veins back to the heart and is pumped through pulmonary arteries to the lungs, where gas exchange again replenishes the blood with oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. All right, then. So you've heard about uh, differences in, in gas concentrations um, and how diffusion works. So this respiratory membrane, what it's all about, uh, and look at some of the factors I've underlined here. I mean, what's going to make diffusion happen better? So which means what's going to help you, you know, oxygenate your blood better? Uh, surface area. And uh, we'll see, as you get older, you lose more and more surface area, and you get diseases like emphysema, you get less and less surface area, less diffusion takes place, and you decrease your ability to um, increase your oxygen levels. And you may not notice it in normal moving around reading a book, but uh, um, when you try to exert yourself sometimes, then you will note, you'll hit that wall where you realize, okay, I don't have the ability to crank up my respiratory system like a healthy person would. A shorter distance helps diffusion, of course. Uh, you have some diseases where you have thickening of the respiratory membrane, and any increase in difference, increase in distance is going to make it less and less. Uh, it's going to make the diffusion slower and slower. Well, how soluble the gases are, we're not talking about oxygen, carbon dioxide here. It's not going to be much of a variable. And the steeper uh, partial pressure gradient, of course, the greater the difference, the more diffusion will take place. So if a person is hypoxic, they have problems getting enough oxygen in their blood, you can put them on an oxygen mask and increase that concentration gradient, and it will increase the diffusion and more oxygen will get into their to their bloodstream where it can help. Yeah. But anyway, that surface area, that last one, is uh, critical. Uh, when you look at athletes or thoroughbred horses or, or uh, other exceptional athletes, the greater the lungs and surface area, the more diffusion can take place. And of course, the heart. You, know, you need to be able to move the blood through it. But those two things make uh, exceptional athletes. So let's talk about how these gases are transported. And uh, it's not a simple case, like uh, the oil in your car is gonna transfer the heat, you know, between uh, the engine and the, the radiator kind of thing. It's, it's gonna be more complex because we're talking about two different gases here we're gonna talk about, the oxygen and carbon dioxide. And you'll see they uh, get between the tissues in the lungs and the lungs and the tissues in, in a couple of different ways. So you need to know oxygen, carbon dioxide, how are they being transported by the circulatory system? So oxygen is transported bound to hemoglobin, almost all of it. There's a small percentage that just simply dissolves in the plasma, but very tiny, negligible amount really. So when hemoglobin is bound to oxygen, it's bright red. We talked about this in the blood section. We call it oxyhemoglobin is the molecule. And then venous blood is not saturated oxygen, is more 
darker, it looks bluish when you see it through the skin and your veins, uh, is a deoxyhemoglobin. So this oxygen needs to bind to the hemoglobin, but not too strongly, but it needs to bind to it. It needs to bind to it in the lungs and hold on to it long enough to deliver it to the tissues, but then it has to let go. It can't hold on to it like a lover. It has to say, you've done your job. I'll go back and get more oxygen in the lungs. I just need to dump it off here. So it needs to be bound, but not too strong. So unstable bound for sure. And then also don't forget that the um, blood does not come back empty. By the time the blood returns to the heart, it's usually in normal circumstances about uh, three quarters still hemoglobin is filled with oxygen. So it comes back and just tops off the tank. All right, well, hemoglobin, a remarkable molecule. I uh, think I told you last semester that uh, uh, an interesting chemistry of it is that um, it has cooperative binding, where if an oxygen binds to one heme, it uh, changes shape, it's more likely that oxygen will bind to the other. So beautiful molecule, big, made out of four polypeptide chains there, the globin part. And the heme part it has an iron molecule in the middle. And you can think how iron rusts with oxygen, right? So there's definitely a reaction with oxygen and iron. <coughs> in this case, <clears throat> it's a reversible reaction. It binds to it temporarily. And then some of these numbers when I teach this class just seem, you know, hard to wrap your head around but imagine each red blood cell which you have in trillions has 250 million hemoglobin molecules right and then you do the math and it's just some crazy amounts you know of oxygen that's carried uh, each time you know the uh, the blood goes through uh, the circuit uh, All right, so here again, the basics of respiration. You should know that uh, in the alveoli of your lungs, they are, uh, it's being, your ventilation is gonna move this tidal flow of fresh air all the time, getting rid, blowing out that carbon dioxide and taking in fresh oxygen, which mixes with the dead air, uh, but it keeps the oxygen levels at about 104 in the alveoli. So it keeps it high enough so that that blood coming back from your tissues is, you know, crazy low, um, like 40. And so the oxygen is really going to um, 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 diffuse into the blood and fill up as hemoglobin. And you see that membrane has to be super thin so that diffusion can take place. Uh, carbon dioxide out, oxygen in. And by the time the blood leaves, it's not at 104, remember, but it's actually 95 because uh, there's going to be some mixing. Uh, these lungs will take some of the blood. And as you saw in earlier animation, I mean, then the blood uh, is carried to the tissues where the oxygen is so low in the tissues, carbon dioxide is so high that diffusion is going to cause the oxygen to be dumped out and the carbon dioxide to bubble into the blood. And then we'll talk about how it's transported uh, back. But just looking at the oxygen, you can see it binds to the hemoglobin, carried to the tissues where it's released, and then uh, it comes back to get refilled in the lungs. All right, looking at just some chemistry here. You can do these experiments in the chemistry lab. They take hemoglobin and they can measure how much of it is saturated oxygen, uh, depending on the concentration of oxygen. You can see here at 95, which is the normal um, uh, partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, uh, it's nearly all saturated. Every hemoglobin filled with oxygen. So pretty impressive. Now let's look at some variables here. And uh, this is just done, you know, this is uh, done in experiments. And if you look at pH in this middle one here, if you look at pH and you say to yourself, look at it, lower pH, I mean more acidic, the oxygen doesn't hold on. It gets rid of the oxygen, hemoglobin does. And what does that mean? How does that pertinent to you, this chemistry right here? Well, let's say you're working out hard even anaerobically, you're, uh, you're running a sprint, you're not even breathing, you're just like giving it your all and you feel your quads are burning, you know, the lactic acid is building, lactic acid, lactic acid. So lactic acid builds up, the pH gets lower, gets more acidic. And in that case, the blood going by 
dumps the oxygen like crazy because it's definitely needed there. And even if you're you're doing a, a marathon, a half marathon, where you're hopefully running aerobically, uh, there's enough uh, oxygen, it's still going to be acidic in those working muscles because of the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide and, uh, and pH are intimately related. Because remember, carbon dioxide binds with water to make carbonic acid, and increases the acidity. So in muscles that are acidic or have high carbon dioxide, the oxygen is just let go like crazy. And lastly, down here is temperature. So you can see muscles that are active are going to be warmer. And so all of these factors, it's just a beautiful, elegant system for this molecule and how well it holds on to the oxygen is related to these variables that are perfectly critical for your body's needs. And so where you need it, it's going to be acidic, high carbon dioxide, warmer temperature, that oxygen just lets go and it's going to move into the tissues. I'll talk about carbon monoxide. It sounds like carbon dioxide. It's got one less oxygen, but it's the difference breathing the two of them between life and death, right? Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, you guys probably have detectors in your homes. Um, it's a product of um, burning fossil fuels and cigarettes have carbon monoxide in it as well. Uh, and it's, it's a dosage kind of thing. If you uh, breathe some carbon monoxide, you'll, you'll be okay. It's, it binds tightly to your hemoglobin like oxygen, but tighter, it does not let go. And so if you keep breathing carbon monoxide, it's gonna keep taking up spaces in your hemoglobin where the oxygen can go. And so you'll feel a headache and over time, they'll turn bluish cyanotic because uh, that you can't carry oxygen because it's all gummed up with carbon monoxide. And um, over time, um, you'll succumb to, to hypoxia. You won't have enough oxygen because of that carbon monoxide. If you're to, um, you get to, to it in time before you expire, um, they give a person uh, pure oxygen and carbon dioxide is given also to help you ventilate quicker. And you try to, you'll get rid of the carbon monoxide, it just takes time. So um, you wanna be very careful. Uh, don't be in a closed up tent with a faulty heater in it with no air movement, or um, sometimes there's a bedroom above a garage. And if you left a uh, car running, it would seep up or a furnace that's, uh, not burning cleanly. So there's, there's ways carbon monoxide um, can, can, uh, can, can enter your life. And uh, if you feel effects of it, you wanna quickly get outside away from the source, keep ventilating and you'll eventually uh, get rid of it if you can. All right, believe it or not, we have several flavors of hemoglobin and um, the hemoglobin molecule, again, is huge. Uh, so the gene to make hemoglobin in the past in evolution has been repeated. And so we have several copies of it. And those copies have subsequently been uh, mutated and, and changed slightly. And the natural selection has made it so that as a fetus, we express or uh, transcribe the fetal hemoglobin. And as an adult, we abandon that and we express the adult hemoglobin. And the fetal hemoglobin is stickier. It binds to oxygen more strongly. This is because this fetus inside the mother is a parasite. And it's just, it needs to suck oxygen from mom. And by the time the blood gets to it, um, it wouldn't be enough if it was just normal. You had both the same kind of hemoglobin. There'd be some transfer. But this way, the fetus can, be, can really hungrily take that oxygen from mom, from mom's blood the umbilical cord. So pretty fascinating. And there's even some therapies uh, where we try to wake up the fetal hemoglobin gene in an adult if, uh, if, if it's necessary. So yeah, pretty cool. And don't forget myoglobin. I talked about this when we did muscles, but it is another relative of hemoglobin. It is uh, through evolution, a copy of the hemoglobin gene mutated to turn into this. And it's a uh, hemoglobin that is found in your muscles, a type of hemoglobin. It is different. Myo means muscle. And uh, it's related, but it's a different molecule. And it uh, it holds on a little uh, um, more tightly to the oxygen. So it only releases its oxygen in the muscles when it's really needed, when there's really low levels. So normally, if you're just walking around, 
the myoglobin is sitting in like a rechargeable battery in your muscles. It's, it's holding on to oxygen. It'll hold it until it really, you really need it. And uh, it will release it then. And let's say you're running a sprint. And then as you recover, the myoglobin will, will, will build up the oxygen stores again. And it, along with more capillaries and blood vessels, is what make, makes dark meat dark versus white meat. All right, let's talk about carbon dioxide. So oxygen binds to hemoglobin and a little bit dissolves in the plasma. Carbon dioxide, we're talking about three methods it gets from the tissues back to the lungs so it can be breathed out. And I don't keep secrets from you guys. They're right here. Uh, some will just dissolve in the plasma more than the oxygen does. And then some of it will bind to hemoglobin like the oxygen, but in a different spot. And then most of it you'll see will dissolve, combine with water, and uh, come back as uh, bicarbonate ions. All right, let's talk about these. I can show you here. So actually, I'll give you the percentages right here. It's about 7% of the carbon dioxide is going to bubble out of the tissues. Remember, it comes from burning sugar. And then it will simply dissolve in the plasma much as carbon dioxide dissolves in your soda pop, dissolves in the fluid. Now, 23% of it, about a quarter of it, the carbon dioxide can um, get into the red blood cells and it binds with hemoglobin, but it doesn't bind on the heme, like oxygen. It binds on an amino group and, and part of the protein part of it. And so what's so cool is it doesn't compete with oxygen. It's not like it's taking a ride on a hemoglobin that a spot that oxygen could have taken because it binds over to the side over here. So no problem. The hemoglobin can carry the carbon dioxide that way. It's called carbamino hemoglobin when the um, carbon dioxide is on the amino group on a, on a protein. Yeah, cool. Takes a ride back like that. But by far the most, the most common way that carbon dioxide gets back to the lungs is that carbon dioxide is going to bubble into the plasma. You see it makes its way into the red blood cell. I'll tell you why. But carbon dioxide is going to combine with water to make carbonic acid. And the carbonic, carbonic acid will break down into bicarbonate ions and then the hydrogen ions. That's why it's an acid, right? Now, this would happen very slowly, except that inside red blood cells, you have an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. And that speeds it up many, many times, many factors. And so that's the deal. Red blood cells are filled with this enzyme all in there of carbonic anhydrase, which catalyzes the reaction to combine carbon dioxide and water to make carbonic acid. And then it can also do the reverse too, uh, depending on the situation. Back at the lungs, it helps it go the other way to release the carbon dioxide. All right. So it's carbon dioxide. Some of it just dissolves in the plasma. Some of it will bind with the hemoglobin. And then most of it uh, will use this enzyme to, to quickly turn into carbonic acid, where the bicarbonate ions um, um, will actually be formed, and then they move out of the red blood cell. And you're saying to yourself, well, damn, it's going to get really acidic, isn't it? Because you're making carbonic acid, and you're telling me it's going to disassociate into bicarbonate ions and uh, hydrogen ions. Well, the hydrogen ions it would get real acidic except they bind to the hemoglobin too. There's a spot that will hold the hydrogen ions. Yeah. And so you're left with bicarbonate that usually leaves the red blood cell. And that's, it goes back in the blood plasma, back to the lungs as bicarbonate. So it's, it's being carried by that. And the hydrogen ions are hitching a ride on the hemoglobins too. Now, because bicarbonate ions by the billions are leaving the red blood cell, um, Turns out they have to be replaced or else you would have, you know, negative ion. If you, if you just got rid of all these negative ions, it would change the um, concentrations. And, and so chloride actually goes through to, to replace it so that everything is, is balanced. So there's this chloride shift. That's all. Chloride shift is when the bicarbonates switch places with chloride ions. And sodium and chloride are the most common ions out in the plasma. So you got lots of them. All right, back at the lungs. The carbon dioxide that is dissolved in the plasma just bubbles off. It just is going to go from its blood into the air because it's higher concentration of blood. It's got wants to get into that air. And then uh, 
the reverse reaction where the bicarbonate ions now are going to combine with that hydrogen ion that the hemoglobin has been holding, right, to make carbonic acid, and then it's going to go back into carbon dioxide and water. And the water stays carbon dioxide, and again, it's going to float off too. And then some of that carbon dioxide that was just stuck on the hemoglobin, at this point, it's going to be released, and it's just going to bubble off as well. So there you go. The three methods that carbon dioxide goes from the tissues to the lungs, and then everything reverses in the lungs to get rid of the carbon dioxide there. Oh, and also, they can take a breath test, a breathalyzer, um, alcohol. Uh, uh, if it's high enough concentration in your, in your, in your it's any, whatever concentration in your blood, it's going to also uh, bubble out into your lungs and you release it, and so they can test blood levels of, of uh, alcohol. Uh, diabetics sometimes have uh, give off acetone, have a fruity kind of smell, and other diseases too. We can we're having things we can breathe through these machines, and it lets you know some of your blood composition. So it's not just oxygen, carbon dioxide, other gases too. All right, there's a chart that will be, be helpful for you to see uh, how oxygen and carbon dioxide has the three different ways that it, it moves. Hey, all right, we're here. So um, lifespan, uh, respiratory system is one of those systems that is likely to kill you along the circulatory system. You know, digestive system, Kidneys usually last that long. Endocrine system, you know, that goes down. And, and efficiency, but you know, your heart and your lungs are, are critical, and then you work them hard your whole life. Um, looking at you, you know, I mentioned your respiratory membrane. My God, you know, uh, you have a peak in your your life where your vital capacity, uh, your respiratory membrane, surface area, everything is at its peak, and then it goes downhill. Um, and as an elderly person. Um, you might not notice, really, because as you get older, you're also less active. Uh, if you were 80 years old, you're like, you know, I feel like my respiratory system's okay. But then you go try to run a 5K or something like, ah, oh, okay, all right. So it's often not tested in the elderly, and so uh, they don't realize how much they've declined. Probably a good idea. Um, as well, you'll see in the elderly, uh, they often, there's less flexibility in the chest. As I mentioned throughout the class, your cartilage turns into bone, so you're, your intercostal cartilages you know, along your chest, uh, everything becomes less flexible. So they often just, you know, using diaphragm breathing because their chest can't really change shape that much because the cartilages between your ribs and your sternum are, uh, have ossified. There's no longer that flexibility. You'll see sometimes a barrel chested shape. Um, and then also people with uh, some lung problems will, will use their neck muscles and their chest muscles more. They have a particular posture if they're having trouble breathing. So some of these, you have to breathe constantly, and your body will do what it takes to uh, um, to ventilate. Um, yeah, and the elderly, their immune system's down, so the macrophages don't clean out the lungs as well, and uh, their cilia. As you get that old, they, <clears throat> the the, the lining is just like in a smoker become. Uh, let's go through metaplasia to turn into squamous cells. So less cilia means less mucus being brought up, more coughing, and uh, they become less. The, the swallowing reflex and gagging and, and, and coughing, uh, yeah, reflexes are, are less efficient, and so you have more issues uh, issues there. Uh, yeah, definitely. So with age, uh, accumulation, especially if you're smoking or you're breathing in irritants, asbestos, things like that, um, you're going to uh, damage that respiratory system quicker and bring upon your death quicker. Oh, I actually I thought about maybe I, I, I don't want to draw this out too much, but looking at uh, now because we're here because of COVID, just so you know what's going on is that uh, the virus really attacks uh, cells in your um, in your alveoli. So the virus looks like this has some RNA in it. The virus will enter the alveoli and they will attack. They will attach to these cells the pneumocytes, type 2 pneumocyte, and uh, they will, inside of it, their, their RNA will start dividing and uh, it will destroy the uh, alveolar cells. And uh, with that, uh, macrophages will come in to uh, help clean up the dead cells and uh, they will give off uh, chemicals that will cause the uh, 
surrounding blood vessels is an inflammatory response. And so histamine will be given off, other chemicals that will dilate these vessels, make them more leaky. And then fluid will start coming out and it will surround the alveoli and some of it will enter the alveoli. And because the surfactant producing cells are being destroyed, you're not making surfactant. And so the alveoli will tend to want to collapse. And you have fluid building up and uh, you're going to bring in more neutrophils, right, to an infection. The neutrophils will come in. They'll try to attack the virus. But in um, besides the virus, they'll be giving off chemicals that will actually start destroying the alveolar cells, all of them. And so you'll end up with a bunch of cell debris, neutrophils, pus, water that's flown in, and you'll you'll fill up these alveoli and they'll they will tend to want to collapse because you've watered down the surfactant, you've destroyed the surfactant cells. And so you imagine on a large scale, um, your alveoli being filled. That's what pneumonia is. You can have a viral or bacterial pneumonia, that infection in these cells, it, it causes the swelling of the blood vessels and causes pulmonary edema and in the interstitial cells more water comes in. And so that's what COVID, the virus is attacking. It likes these uh, these lung cells when it gets down there. It's the upper lower respiratory tract. And this causes a cascade of a lot of other uh, issues. So a little bit of that. I found a good, a uh, uh, little bit clinical, a good uh, uh, video talking about uh, COVID. And I'll, I'll post that on the Blackboard too, for I'm sure all of you are interested in that. All right, just a few more things I want to talk about. It's just that at UNE, we're at sea level. We're at Maine. Well, unless you get up to Katahdin or farther inland, uh, we're pretty damn close to sea level, uh, most of the population in Maine. Um, and the deal is this. When you go up in elevation, when you go up in the mountains, climb Mount Washington, it's still the same percentage of oxygen up there. It's just that the whole pressure, you have less atmosphere above you because you're closer to the sky. You're closer. There's less uh, column of air above you, so you can see up at Mount Everest. We're talking about a uh, partial pressure. I mean, an atmospheric pressure of 200 something, right? Instead of 760. So there's a lot less air, a lot less air pressure, and so that it's harder to get that uh, air in your lungs enough to to cause that uh, diffusion. So that's why you often need oxygen at high, uh, at high levels, like bottled oxygen, because uh, there's just not enough of it. Same percentage, but less overall pressure. And of course, creatures that live up at high elevation, like alpacas and such, uh, they've got a different hemoglobin that is stickier, so they have that ability. And uh, uh, people up that high, I mean, if you go to see Machu Picchu, um, when you arrive, or even Quito, Ecuador, you'll, you'll have a headache. You'll have a headache soon after. You're not supposed to drink much the first few times you get the alcohol when you first get there um, because of that. And you, your body will adjust. You'll make EPO to make more red blood cells, and you can't adjust. Uh, but, you know, climbing Everest, you know, people die all the time. There's some severe issues that can happen when we, uh, we try to push it. And then for your athletes out there, um, animal or, or human athletes, uh, I'll talk about... Uh, uh, how the respiratory and circulatory system, they are what's gonna keep the oxygen moving to your muscles. And that's gonna allow you to perform. Ah, so here is a, oh, this creature right here is a male pronghorn antelope. It's a fascinating mammal. It's the only one in its family. It's this antelope that lives out west. It is wicked fast. And not only fast, it can run for hours at high speed. It's just an amazing, amazing athlete. You can see here, some of you over in exercise physiology, they can hook you up to such things where you're on a treadmill and you can uh, measure the amount of uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide you used. Or like things like crabs, they can put in these containers with a treadmill and then just measure the oxygen concentration in that um, box. Or some of you have took Bio 104, you, you had crickets in these little, you had cold and warm crickets in these little containers, right? With something that would observe. Oh, then a carbon dioxide meter. Yeah, so there's various ways to measure respiration. Um, and if you look, this is uh, two animals of similar size, this goat, which is perfectly fine goat, and this pronghorn, like I say, this amazing athlete. And so you look at this, you can, this is applicable to humans too. Look at the, uh, uh, the anatomical and physiological features between these two animals with very different 
um, athletic abilities, right? Uh, yeah, lung capacity. So look at this. The prong arm has huge lungs, you know, compared to this goat. Yeah, cardiac output. So the heart. Yeah, obviously the heart and the lungs. Muscle mass. Yeah, I mean the prong arm has more, but that's that's a little more similar. But uh, uh, definitely when you look at uh, features of the the lungs and uh, heart, you're going to see that in this athlete much different than this well very dexterous goat but let's just say it, it's not going to win any uh, marathons like the pronghorn would and also can't we can't, can't not talk about diving animals uh, right off campus you know i've seen whales i've seen dolphins right off campus um and uh they can dive look at this 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 one whale can dive for 85 minutes you know talk about human record being 11 and a half minutes right without oxygen so um, how do they do this and and if, if you look um, they'll breathe at the surface and they'll stockpile oxygen then they'll dive and they, they shut off non-essential features and um, uh, the, the blood is just uh, oxygen is conserved uh, for their muscles and their their brain and what they need it for now look seals have twice as much volume as humans a, a similar size seal so this blood um, they, their spleen is, is, is huge and when they dive they keep that oxygenated blood in their spleen and they squeeze the spleen they let it out they have more myoglobin and the, and their heart rate drops and if you haven't done the lab yet i don't want to ruin the surprise but uh mammals like humans have this this reflex too if you put your your head in cold water or you dive in water your heartbeat slows uh, it's just a, a reaction to help conserve um, uh, oxygen and so diving animals show it beautifully <sighs> that looks like it. All right, so here we have, uh, um, again, the, the review of the chapter at the end. So you guys, uh, it's strange uh, hearing myself talk. You guys never told me I sounded like this. Thanks a lot. Um, but um, hopefully this is uh, uh, useful for you. Um, I'll put the PowerPoints will be up there also, so you can look at those, as well as this being a video. It looks good on the, up on the TV or something like that, or on your phone, you can watch that. And, read this respiratory chapter, learn it, and I, I will make a uh, mini test over this chapter for you. And uh, you'll need to take it next week. I forgot the dates, but, but they're up there. All right, I'm signing off, you guys. I'll load these up and um, hope you have a good night.